Welcome back to Homesteading with the Hebert's guys. Today we're going to do a uh, collaboration with Sprague River Homestead. Um, we're going to do the 15 questions. Hey, I'm Kanan and this is Nikki. We are the Manleys here at Sprague River Homestead. We are a 100 acre homestead based in southern central Oregon. Uh, we are completely off-grid. We are solar-based, and we raise uh, some poultry, goats, LGD dogs, rabbits, uh, and do a little bit of everything around here. Garden, and uh, on good years, cut our own hay, all that good stuff. All right. First question is, what is the biggest mistake new homesteaders make? Uh, I've mentioned this in other videos. I think, having been a new homesteader myself, uh, doing too much, too soon, too fast. Not enough research, too much enthusiasm, and not a thorough understanding of how much work the things you think you're going to do actually are. I'll agree with that, but I'm going to add in there that I think new homesteaders don't do enough planning. You kind of said research in that. But I think really sitting down and writing out paper. Everybody wants to go buy that wood and that trailer full of wood like this. And yet when you ask them what they're going to build, they're like stuff. That's the answer. <laughs> so they're going to build a barn. They're going to build raised beds. They're going to build something. They go buy a load of wood and yet they don't even know if they have enough and they haven't planned out enough. So not enough planning or research is my answer. The second question is going to be what advice would you have for new homesteaders? Uh, slow down and go small. <laughs> the number of people I see that go out and they buy like a dozen milking goats because they're going to make cheese and do all this great stuff. When you're setting up your homestead, you don't have time for any of that. Or the people that go out and in the first year they buy, you know, a beef cow and a dairy cow and a dozen chickens and 12 rabbits. And they're trying to garden and it's like, when do you have time for all this? Start small, seriously. We've always had a rule, not that I have always um, honored that rule, but the rule has been no more than one new variety of animal on the homestead in a year. I try and get, get all poultry in one thing. He doesn't buy it. But one thing at a time, slow down, plan small, go bigger later. Once you've achieved some form of mastery, that would be my advice. So my advice is gonna be that you need to set forth the vision of what your homestead is gonna be. And you need to set the timeline. If, if that's a year, three, five, 10, a lifetime, whatever it is. Once you have that plan, you and you alone, or you and your family that's on the homestead are the ones that live and die by that plan. Don't ask your family for advice. Don't ask your friends for advice. And please do not ask the internet to solve all your problems and help plan what your homestead is capable of doing. That is something you have to sleep with every single night. So do not ask the internet to help plan how you're gonna live your life. Set your plan and stick to it. If you have to change it, you make the decision to do so. And we see this a lot on the internet in some of the Facebook groups where people will post a, an aerial map of their property and say, I got 12 acres, these are the animals I wanna have, how do I set up my homestead? No, <laughs> no, that's not gonna work because nobody knows your unique you know, topography, where your water runs, it's up to you. Do not ask some Yahoo off of Facebook to help you. <laughs> or some Yahoos off of YouTube, don't ask them either. Question. All right, so question number three is, what is your favorite animal to raise on the homestead? Anybody who's watched us knows or thinks they know that the answer is going to be rabbits. That's probably a fair guess. It's not, actually. When we lived in Mississippi, I had donkeys, and I loved my donkeys. I would still have my donkeys if not for some outrageous amounts of fees to bring them across country. Um, the other part of that was our gelding was getting kind of older and uh, he didn't travel in trailers very well. He got really freaked out. So for the, for the, you know, for the happiness of them, we sold them. 
and uh, they went off to a farm to be some pets uh, like a couple hours away from us they made the trip okay but um, yeah donkeys I really miss my donkeys I miss my donkeys all the time and I mentioned it to him uh, eventually we will get some here uh, but we haven't really been set up for them yet and um, yeah that's that's my favorite how about yours I could say the same for the donkeys. The two or three that we had down there were pretty awesome. Uh, I think the thing we have right now that I enjoy the most is the goat. And since I take care of them every day, they're kind of my favorite animal. Um, they're all just weird. They're all just weird creatures. They all have different <laughs> personalities. Some are friendly, some are not. Some are talkative, some are not. So I just like the, the difference in all the personalities of all the goats we have. And babies are so freaking cute. <laughs> All right, so the fourth question is what's your favorite vegetable to grow? It's a really tough one. Uh, probably the one that made me feel like an absolute rock star was uh, this last year. I got tomatillos. Everybody told me you couldn't grow them here. And <laughs> yeah, I grew them in one of the domes, and so it was kind of in a greenhouse deal. But I made so much freaking salsa verde that, uh, yeah, I probably won't grow a tomatillo for the next five years. <laughs> but I did it, and my plants were like this freaking tall and loaded, and they were awesome. I think I'm, my favorite has been kale. Uh, it grows, it grows really well here. It grows <laughs> months, months, months per year. It's still alive now. And it's still alive now, and here we are in. January yeah so it's just it's I mean you can basically put it in anything we put it in lasagna we put it in burgers we put it in chili chili I mean it's it's such a hearty vegetable you can almost use it in anything and replace a lot of stuff with it so kale for me and I and I grow a lot of different varieties of it and the rabbits love it too but we make kale chips and stuff too so the next question is what was the best day on your homestead this one is very, very easy for me to remember. So for the first, what is it, six, eight, nine months or whatever I lived here, we didn't have power other than we had to run a generator. So the best day on the homestead for me was about four and a half years ago. And it was literally the first day that we had power into the house and here on the homestead. Up to that point, we had been putting in all the electrical, we had been putting in all the water lines. The water was already in. The last piece of infrastructure for us to be self-contained really was getting the electrical in. So I can remember the day that we had solar all the way in, means the water was already in. I was able to walk into the bathroom, click on the light, and I went and took a hot shower. <laughs> and it was just like the most amazing feeling ever because I could stand there in my own power, using my own water, taking a nice long hot shower, and it was probably one of the best showers I've had in five years since then. And believe it or not, I don't actually have an answer for this one. Um, I had a lot of really good days. Like, you know, I had five litters of rabbits today. They look pretty good. We've had days of great kidding. Uh, there's been days where like, I pulled out my first tomato that was grown here. Um, so I've had a lot of days, but no one day sticks out for me. Going along with your best day, what is your worst day on the home? What, what's been your worst day on the homestead? Hmm. This one I think could be a tie. <laughs> um, so mine was before we had our shop in, there was a day in there that um, Nikki's dad wanted his trailer back. So. <laughs> It was in the back side section of the property and it was kind of getting to that time in spring when we get to where we call the melt. So a lot of the snow kind of starts melting in that and the ground gets kind of heavy, heavy, mucky, you know? So I remember that I was gonna go back there and get the trailer. So I fired up the backhoe and it's a nice big heavy piece of equipment and I drove it kind of across a little ditch right out here and I buried that sucker <laughs> to the axles. So it's like nine to 10 inches inside of mud and this is something that probably weighs tons <laughs> and so it was like okay well we can't get the backhoe out we don't know what to do with it so at that point we go try to find another path because we had a smaller tractor we're like we're gonna get it we're gonna get the other tractor nikki grabs the tractor we go we're like okay 
let's go this way, you drive it, I'll watch. And I watched her drive the tractor and buried it to the axle. I should preface this with the fact that having watched him do it with the heavy <laughs> equipment, I took a piece of rebar and went the entire track of where I was going, plunging that thing in, trying to figure out, was it really soft? No indication that it was soft anywhere. And when I was driving around, I made it almost, I was what, 15 feet from that stupid trailer? Yeah. And I am not kidding you. I went from like cruising on the dirt, barely leaving marks, to all the way into the axle just that fast. Like it was like driving off of a cliff and I was stuck. <laughs> so that makes two pieces of equipment stuck in the mud. Later on, her dad brought over his one ton uh, diesel. We hooked up a big heavy chain trying to get stuff out and we end up snapping that chain and almost the chain almost went right into his truck missed it by that much well and so. then you tried chain he tried so then dad tried to uh chain the 480 to a massive tree and pull himself out with the bucket and yeah no he broke that chain as well because yeah. remember we broke that chain twice so yeah that wasn't that yeah wasn't so tough. that was probably one of the worst days now second to that i'm gonna call it the tie is the first time we met our old neighbors. <laughs> oh God. So they were here visiting and we hit, this This had already happened. We'd already lost our equipment, right? So at the time they were here visiting their property for the first time. And we had already told them where you're gonna go. They're like, we're gonna drive back to our property. We're like, don't, don't, you will lose, you will lose your- There was no road. There was no road. You will lose your SUV in the mud. And he said, we've already got two tractors buried back there. So. They stayed the night. The next day they got up. What do you think they did? They tried to drive back there and they buried their little Toyota SUV. So in order to get them out, it took our Suburban, which we lost in the mud trying to get to theirs. We tried to get a Bobcat, which is our skid steer that's sitting back here if you've seen other videos. We lost it in the mud. And then my dad, now dad showed up with the Bobcat to help. So picture this we had just put in our driveway so we had gravel so we're talking 50 60 feet off this car is buried because there was a little bit of a dirt road right there and she thought it was soft so she actually moved over into basically the wilderness the, the runoff and buried it right so she's 50 60 feet off the gravel we got our suburban up close enough to tie onto it before we buried so now now we've got the suburban about 10 feet from it in front of that we've got the bobcat another 10 or 15 feet in front of that so the bobcat was only what 15 feet or so yeah. off the gravel but it's all stuck so what we ended up having to do is dad had his truck we backed up as close as we could still being on the gravel we had to hook up to the bobcat an inch because it was only, what, 15, 20 feet is all. I, I had a short little gravel pad for turning around the dump truck that was delivering. So maybe it was 30 feet, but yeah. it wasn't very far. So we had it all, and we had to inch the bobcat out, okay? Once the bobcat had hit the gravel, we parked it off, backed up chain on chain to our Suburban and did the same thing, you know? forward as far as we could back it up rechain inch that sucker out <laughs> by the time it was over we had what three chains hooked up i believe mm -hmm. to the neighbor's car to pull them out oh and did we mention this is valentine's day and by the time we were finished it was what 29 degrees probably outside mm -hmm. it was uh it let's just say it made a lasting impression it did we lost two trucks, three pieces of equipment within days of each other <laughs> into the mud, and we've never done it since. We learned our lesson that time. All right, so the next question is, why do you homestead where you are? So we actually had a video about this on our channel not too long ago where we talked about uh, why we were here. And uh, basically it kind of works out that my parents on this property is a vacation home. When we were looking to move back to Oregon, we kind of uh, we kind of picked it as like a place to land kind of thing. 
and got here. My parents ended up moving up the street. They were up in Goldendale, Washington, so they moved like the five, six hours and are like a mile and a half from us. And uh, so yeah, with family close by and mom and dad ended up giving it to me as part of our inheritance. So it was a place to live, uh, it was paid for, and my folks were close by, so that's kind of why we picked here. What's our most valuable tool on the homestead? Gotta be hands down for me, uh, my cordless impact driver, because I'm always building stuff and uh, I don't have quite the strength, especially my elbow that I used to have. So beating nails for me doesn't really work. So I screw everything together. And uh, while I like the old cordless like drill with a good screw bit in it, man, those impact guns, the, the impact drivers that they've got out now, so much nicer. You don't tend to overdrive screws like you used to. So I think mine is gonna be something different. I, I prefer to use a chainsaw. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite homestead tools because obviously we cut our own firewood every year as much as possible. Uh, we use it a lot in construction, so I mean, we've got three different three different size chainsaws based on what we're doing, and that's probably the one thing we use more frequently throughout the year than anything else. Yeah, I mean, we're trimming trees and all kinds of stuff, so. Yeah. Chainsaws. <laughs> so what started us on um, homesteading? Insanity. <laughs> No, I've always been interested in that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, I like to do everything for myself, I guess. I grew up on Little House on the Prairie, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Um, big fan of Eustace Conway out at Turtle Island. Uh, Mountain Men TV show, lots of Alaska stuff. So, uh, I don't know. And then we were living in Tennessee and we were moving to Mississippi and we had a hurricane come through. Um, a little thing called Katrina <laughs> when he was living actually in Mississippi and I was still in Tennessee trying to sell the house. So we kind of got involved in some of the prepper type stuff. But uh, the thing we didn't like about that was that it was mostly, um, mostly people that wanted to buy their way into uh, self-reliance. <laughs> they, we went to a meeting and they, they talked a lot about being self-reliant and, and we thought that sounded pretty good until we realized that that to, to them meant closets full of freeze-dried food <laughs> and that really wasn't uh, self-reliant to us. So we started looking in and found out there was a whole movement for homesteading. I'd, I'd been a big reader of Mother Earth News for, oh gosh, on since high school. So I knew it was kind of out there. but. After that, it kind of prompted us to uh, to think about, you know, having supplies on hand. And our power would go out. When we got moved to Mississippi, our power would go out all the time. And so you kind of kind of had to cultivate an interest in doing it yourself kind of thing. How about you? Uh, I think my thing probably was the self-reliant factor. Um, just similar, similar. I mean, I lived through Katrina. In, inland and it wasn't even on the coast it was three hours north of the coast but I can tell you the days after that and the stuff of I mean it was stuff of nightmares on, on some days you just people would would uh, riot over not getting gas or not getting ice because it was you know late summer and I, I just I would rather be much prepared for just a better life than you know a natural disaster or anything else but I think homesteading is more about preparing to live a good life and doing for yourself than being reactionary to something. Now, what is your your ideal homestead size? Uh, well, you know, we, we started off with 20 here and then we bought the other 40 and then another 40. So we actually have 100. And I would say that for like 90% of people, it's too much. <laughs> Our previous two places before that were right around 10 acres it was like 10 and 12. 12 ish yeah i think that's a pretty good size i mean it kind of depends a little bit on what you're gonna do um 
but I feel like 10 is big enough to keep the neighbors back a little bit and give you a little bit more freedom to do the things you want to do. Like our 10 acres that we had in Jackson, we gardened, uh, had fruit trees, we had the chickens, we had turkeys, we had ducks, uh, the donkeys, we had llamas, we had goats, and we still had a lot of room to expand. Here, you know, it's hard to do any of that on the 20 that we have just because we don't have the grass for it all year long. So we end up buying more hay here than we did there. Um, so I guess I guess that's kind of the answer. Is it, it's totally subjective on what you want to do and where you want to be. But for here, for us now, 20 acres I think is awesome. The 80 is just like my tinker toy. <laughs> but 20 is probably pretty good. You know, when we were in Jackson um, or up in Tennessee, I would have said 10 would have been ideal. Uh, somewhere in there. Yeah, I, th I think it's going to depend on your ability to grow stuff. Because like you said, in Mississippi, we, we <laughs> could um, range all of our animals on grass, natural grass in the pastures. Like 10 months out like of the year. Like 10 months out of the year. So it, it really didn't matter. And buying hay wasn't so bad. Here, I mean, it's like six on, six off, it feels like. Yeah, if we're lucky. Yeah, so um, I, I think if you're going to start out... Um, I think you can be pretty darn dangerous to yourself on five acres, uh, <laughs> depending on how true. busy you are. So I'm gonna say five to 10 is ideal for most people. I think that's enough to get yourself into trouble, but not too much that you can get like completely carried away. So five to 10, you say 20, eh, was well, somewhere in there. Five to 20 acres, I think you can be <laughs> pretty uh, dangerous for the rest of your life. What growing zone are you in? And what are the challenges you face there? Well, what is our growing zone is, is a very um, confused <laughs> question because most of the USDA zone maps show us as like 6A, only we get way colder than 6A and like hotter in the summer. So we're kind of a weird hodgepodge of like 5B, 6A. And because where we're at varies so wildly by elevation, like people up the street are in a whole different zone. So yeah, I, I, I try to plan anything that's like permaculture, like trees and bushes. Um, I shoot with 5B because it's colder, the colder raining on it. Um, and yeah, I, I, that's usually about what I try and garden with, even though they tell us differently. Which makes it kind of a challenge to go buy stuff at the store because Klamath Falls, where all the shopping is, is pretty much zone 6, like 6A, 6B. So that's what they stock for, and a lot of it's not cold enough for us. So that's kind of also our challenges here is, uh, you know, big snow a lot of times in the winter. Not that we're getting it this winter. Um, we've had temperatures in the summer go well over 100, even though this year was kind of mild. Very little water, so um, yeah, drought's kind of a big deal here. Wild temperature swings is another thing that's kind of wild to uh, plan for. I mean, we get frost like some years every single month out of the year, and that means July in, in, in uh, August. We've had snow in late June. So really kind of wild, inconsistent. I would definitely say here it's you gotta have a greenhouse to survive with most things. What's your least favorite homestead chore? Oh boy, uh, I got a couple of them that are kind of tied in my head anyway. Uh, I hate housework. <laughs> and I, I'm gonna count that because every homestead has a house, hence the home. <laughs> Um, I'm not, I, I hate cleaning rabbit trays. I really do. It's just part of it. Um, but cleaning barns don't bother me as much. So go figure. I, I don't like cleaning poultry houses either. And butchering. Like I don't, it's, it's all part of it. And I accept that. And I like filling the freezers. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy that. I mean, I guess, I'm sure somebody does. I, I don't not really fun to me how about you oh mine's easy if it, i would never ever want to have to clean out those barns or poultry barns i hate scooping poop <laughs> oh 
oh, that is, oh, those are, those are the chores that I just absolutely despise having to do. But See, the goat barn doesn't bother me. You get into kind of a rhythm. It's, although his goat, his goat angel, for some reason, as soon as she sees a scoop and you're in there trying to clean, she wants to come stand like right next to you and pee, like every single time. I don't know what her problem is, but she loves to make it a mess as fast as you can scoop it. <laughs> She's a jerk. So what channel or content creator would you like to work with coming up in 2020? Tell you the truth, I literally do not watch anybody else homesteading. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I don't have time, so don't ask. <laughs> This was a this was a tough question. Um, so I don't think there's anybody out there that I could say this channel I would like to do stuff with. But I would say this. Um, I'm pretty territorial on our skill set, and I'm pretty brave and bold in my personality. So I would say anybody out there that would want to challenge us um, on homesteading and. and this would be something, it would be kind of like this flyaway destination thing. I would love to get, of course, us and let's say nine other channels, big or small, flyaway getaway, and we have like a homestead off. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for that. I know, I know. Nobody's going to have time for that because we're all busy homesteading. <laughs> but I think, I think this would be like the ultimate challenge. Take 10 channels put them against each other at homesteading and you pick, you know, you pick your categories, you pick gardening or you pick uh, animals or, you know, whatever it is. Oh God, I'll lose. So self-sustainability no and, and you put them out there <laughs> and you do a homestead off to see who really can walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. Because I think there's too many faux setters out there that put on a lot of drama for their channels That's to get true. people to watch and they don't do enough doing. So I want to go out there I'll put us in it, and I say this because she's going to say no to it. He's nominating us. I'm nominating <laughs> us right here against anybody out there to out-homestead us. Okay. Anyway, yeah, we don't watch a whole lot of, of homesteading type stuff. Um, I will admit that if I watch anybody, it's going to be the smaller channels. And I'm talking like our size are smaller because, yeah, he's right. There's a lot of Fosteaders out there, and it seems like the bigger you are, the less realistic you are. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of over these channels that hit like 50,000 and decide to start doing all kinds of um, real niche projects, whether it's raising rabbits or quail or whatever that they really have no interest in, that they don't stick with very long, but they use it just to make videos, and yeah, we don't really get into that. So. Um, I've got a couple of channels I'm watching right now, of course, um, Punky Rooster, because I'm digging her new hat. I like her a lot, and uh, she's doing stuff that I probably will never do, but I, I dig what she's doing. Um, I'm going through and looking at some old, old videos from Edge of Nowhere Farm, um, and then, you know, I, I go through and I watch videos sometimes of some of the people who comment on our videos, so um, smaller channels. That's what you should take it away from is I, the bigger channels don't interest me. Uh, if we're going to work with anybody, it's going to be the smaller channels. All right. So what's the worst job you've ever had? Mine's pretty easy. So in college, I think it was college, I made van bodies. So if you imagine like a cargo van kind of deal where they have kind of like the boxy structure on that, I worked for a company. Um, that made those vans from scratch. So it's kind of like all aluminum extrusions and all that stuff. I made it Is either two or three weeks to it and I maybe it wasn't even that long But I just did not like the job at all. It really just wasn't for me I'm a mechanical guy. I love building stuff but that job for whatever reason just struck a nerve with me And I I bailed after like two weeks shortest job I've ever had and probably the one that I will, will never look forward to even talking about it was oh just wasn't for me what about you worst job well hmm I, I will start this by saying up until about what 25 I was probably the queen of uh, <laughs> not working anywhere for more than like six to nine months 
Um, but probably the thing that strikes me, like I worked in retail some, and, and that wasn't the greatest. And I worked in office stuff, like dental healthcare type stuff. And that wasn't so bad. But probably the thing that I absolutely hated the most is I worked for an accountant for, I want to say about nine months. Yeah, about that. And I was his office manager, and it was just him. He had a part-time guy and then his son that worked there doing billing for uh, fraternities and sororities. And it was the most horrendously boring job I have ever had in my life. And I, I like math and can do accounting, and it's not that, but when you work for somebody that's self-employed and then there's always that little bit of family drama when they've got like one of their kids working there but on top of that during the slower part of the year my boss would like not come to work sometimes so you go into this we were in this quiet little little um business park and half the buildings were um construction guys that pretty much only used in their offices for meetings so we had like 45 parking spots and if I pulled in and there were like five being used that was huge so I'd pull into this little this little business park and I'd go into the office and I may be there all day and never see another soul there wouldn't be that much to do a lot of times I'd have like two hours worth of work all day to do the phone wouldn't ring because a lot, you know, when I started there, it was outside of tax season. So you heard almost nothing. And then we got to like, I don't know, February ish, and things picked up and it was crazy busy. And you had the IRS coming in, and my boss would actually show up because he's working with people and intermediating with the IRS and all that fun stuff. So there was like three months out of nine where I didn't want to like hang myself with my phone cord. <laughs> but the rest of the time, for somebody who is outside and doing all the time, you can probably imagine it was just so stifling and so boring and so miserable that, yeah, I don't think I'd ever want to go back to that. I hated it. Hated it. Made good money. No overtime. I hated it. Just hated it. So the last question is, what kind of power do you have, and what would you go to if you were going to change it? I think for this <laughs> one, it's going to be pretty obvious what kind of power we are. We are 100% solar off grid, with a generator, a diesel generator as a backup. Uh, so, Al, if I could change, would I change? Absolutely not. We have always been on grid until we moved here and did solar. Um, I will say though, if I could change our current setup from solar and a diesel generator, I would add a wind generator just to see the difference of it. Um, we, when we first moved here, were told it's really not very windy. And nice. the truth is, <laughs> there, there's like maybe like five days a year that we don't have some kind of a breeze. It may not be enough to generate a significant amount of power, but the days that it's stormy with clouds and everything that we have to run the generator, it's always windy. So I think you could do um, the biggest solar array we have now, plus adding a wind generator, and then maybe leave the uh, leave the diesel as, the, as like the tertiary backup or the secondary backup. Uh, I think that would be so solar, add wind, and then keep the diesel. I totally agree with this, and I. I still think down the road when all the other projects are done around here, we may look at that because we do. We have a lot of wind. The problem that you run into with wind generators is that you, if you've got a lot of big trees, you have to get up really high to get around them. And right now where we get the most wind, the trees are really small because they had a fire come through here like 25, 30 years ago, but they're getting bigger all the time. And so my concern with this is getting a wind generator up high enough that when the trees actually grow, we'll still have the wind. But who knows, stick around. Might be fire 10 years and we might actually get to it. All right guys, so thank you for coming along with this uh, question answering for the homesteaders.
And if you guys want to hear my answers to this, what I'm going to do is I'll put a link to it on uh, here in the description once I know that it's up on Sprig River Homestead. So you can all go over to their channel and check it out. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye.